Good morning, dear friends. It is good to be with you today again in this strange way, but still we are gathered together and it's always nice to see the good mornings, hello from so-and-so showing up in our chat box just to remind us that, uh, that everybody is here and we're doing this and all in this together. And so we begin today in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. The peace of Christ is with you always. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove us far from everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And here's a reading from Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And here's a reading from Matthew. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So many of our conversations today, be they political, social, religious, or family, as though we could even separate any of those in distinct categories, they come down to this question. What kind of communities do we want? And amongst all of the descriptors that we might come up with on our own, there would certainly be some upon which most people of good will and good intention would agree. So wonder with me, what kind of communities do we want? What would all of us agree upon when it comes to our towns, our country, our family, our church, all of our communities? What are the words that describe them? And if we consider the church, 
and even more particularly the body of Christ called Trinity here in this place, what kind of community do we want to be? This is, after all, a much harder question than we can simply answer in a set of adjectives, but the adjectives are a good start. Those words and images offer us a glimpse and a vision of what we believe the church ought to be, how it ought to look and what defines it. Those words offer us possibilities for how we live together with one another and how our living together with one another says something to the communities outside of this place. So we might also then ask the question of how this community of Trinity is different than the other communities to which it belongs. How do those words that describe our desired towns and country fit or not with our desired church? All of us will recognize that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between the kingdom of this old world and the kingdom of God that is envisioned in how Christians gather together, live together, and serve the world together. But most of us will also recognize that the calling as a Christian in the life of the church community demands much. Particularly, the far-reaching nature of how our life in the church ought to feed and inform and change the ways we live in our other communities. St. Paul offers a description of the church that helps to define it, largely by defining it through our relationship with one another. And here's what he says as he wonders about what kind of community the gospel requires. Owe oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. The commandments are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. The Christian community is one that is defined by love for one another. Might we all agree that this is the community we want when we gather together in this place? Might we all agree that this defines what we want all of our communities to look like? Our families defined by love, our friendships defined by love, our churches defined by love, our businesses defined by love, our local and state and national and international communities defined by love. Yet as that list went on, we likely recognize the difficulty, if not the impossibility, of many communities being defined by love. If even our families aren't always grounded in love, the people closest to us. If even our churches aren't always grounded in love, the place where we hear of the centrality of love for all of our relationships, there is little chance that our businesses, our governments, or any other community would be easily defined by love. We do, after all, live in this old world where love seems to be in much shorter supply than we would often prefer, even in our own hearts and lives. We can imagine that Christ knew a bit about this old world then when he spoke his words in today's gospel. Today we hear again the well-worn process for what it looks like to forgive one another, to return to a relationship of love rather than hate or anger or competition or indifference. If we would have a community defined by love in this old world where love is often hard to come by, it would be a community. It is also defined by forgiveness when we have been wronged and of justice when we sin and our own most grievous faults weigh heavy. First, disagreeing with another member of the body of Christ? Go to them in person and talk it over. And if that doesn't restore the relationship, bring others with you who may be offered as witnesses and intervention of sorts. If the relationship is still broken, take it to the whole church. And if that doesn't work, 
excommunication. A wonderful plan. As we seek to define our communities in love based on forgiveness when we have been wrong, yet we know again that we live in this old world and any plan that is put in place is guaranteed to have flaws. It is guaranteed to have flaws because it's guaranteed to have people, us, involved with it. So oftentimes, this means of seeking restoration hasn't been used to seek restoration or reconciliation, but rather to exert power. The person who has the most power to take it to the entire church often does. The loudest voice with the most connections often wins, if we would call it winning. Other times we remember that Rarely is there one person who is completely at fault while the other remains blameless. The community is defined then by competition over who was wronged more and who deserves a heavier measure of apology and regret. And as we move through this returned relationship, this reconciled community, we regularly find that as a blueprint or a plan, it is often abused by those in power, trampled on those, on, by those who seek to shame, and tarnished by those who love to win at all costs. We have forgotten that there is simply plenty of sin to go around for all. Yet here is the good news. For if there's plenty of sin to go around, there's also certainly plenty of grace to go around as well. Reconciliation and peace and forgiveness and love are recovered, but the story does not end there. Shall we mention the scope of this reconciliation? Earlier we've heard that once the steps have been completed, if reconciliation hasn't been restored, we are to treat those who have sinned as Gentiles and tax collectors. In this old world, the answer is simple. We kick them out and send them on their way. Yet, how was it again that Jesus interacted with Gentiles and tax collectors? They were invited to the table again. If reconciliation hasn't been achieved by the time they are Gentiles and tax collectors, we invite them to the table again. And we'll hear next week how many times that invitation is to be extended. The end is reconciliation and love, whatever that means, whatever the cost and however long it takes. But there is more to this good news for Gentiles and tax collectors like us who continue to be invited back to the table of grace and community. We know the process Christ lays out. We also know the final verse of this reading. We often do not know them together. So hear those final words again. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Buried in conflict with a brother or sister, Christ is there. Furious over the actions of one of God's beloved, Christ is there as well. Exhausted from constant calling out and frustration with interactions between those called Christian, Christ is there. Christ is there in our love and in our communities. Christ is also there in our anger and in our disagreements. Perhaps especially there. What kind of communities do we want? What kind of church do we want? One that leans towards love and reconciliation. One where Christ would be present. And indeed, Christ has 
promised that he will be. May our communities and our lives reflect the Christ that gathers us together and gathers with us. Amen. Shall we sing? Gathered together in this one faith, let us speak the words of that faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Unite your church, O God. Grant us the gifts of repentance and reconciliation. Bless the cooperative work of churches in this community, especially Trinity and Church of the Resurrection. Strengthen ecumenical partnerships. Guide the work of the Lutheran World Federation, the World Council of Churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protect your creation, O God. Teach us ways that do not harm what you have entrusted to our care. 
renew and enliven places suffering from drought, flood, storms, or pollution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn nations and leaders from ways that lead to death. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation, teaching us to recognize one another as beloved neighbors. Guide legislators, civil servants, judges, and police towards laws and practices that protect the well-being of all, especially those who have so often been cast down by those same leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Tend to all in need of your compassion. Hear the cries of those waiting justice and those yearning for forgiveness. Give community to the lonely and neighbors to the outcast. Shelter all who are vulnerable in body, mind, or spirit, especially those we name aloud on our lips or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have died in the faith. As we've equipped them, equip us with your protection and power until with them we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks, Lord God, for all who labor, especially as we consider the holiday to be celebrated tomorrow of Labor Day. We give thanks for those who labor in jobs who are paid un uh, unfairly, who are paid poorly. And we lift up the work of unions. We lift up the work of organizations who gather together to be the neighbors for all of those who work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered together, we are bold to pray the words that our Lord has taught us and whatever words speak most dearly and clearly to our hearts. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so, dear friends, just a few brief announcements that I would lift up to you. As I mentioned in the prayers, tomorrow is Labor Day. Take a moment tomorrow to give thanks for all of those who labor, all of those essential workers, and the long history uh, that we just saw the announcement from Cindy, and the long history that we have in our country of labor unions and those who have organized to protect the rights of the workers against those who would seek to use workers and their work for their own benefit. Pray for them, and if you happen to see them tomorrow out and about working on what should be a day of rest for all workers, tell them thank you. I would also lift up next week is God's work our hands Sunday? It will be different. We will be here online, but we will also be out in the parking lot. So for all of those who would like to join in person, I hope to see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. And so the plan will be you'll pull in off of Reddick. You'll be directed where to park. We will be remaining in our cars, and you are asked to keep a mask on at all times, even though we're in our cars. We will have our windows down for that. Um, we will have communion as well, so I hope you will be able to join us for that. I will also mention, next week following worship, uh, there will be a few opportunities for service. 
Finally, I would mention that all of this information is in the email. And second, please, please, please send an RSVP to Carrie in the office, whether you will A, be joining us for worship, B, be joining us for service, or C, be joining us for worship and service following afterwards. We need to have a good count uh, of how many people so we can plan uh, the, the number of cars and the spacing. So again, please, please RSVP your attendance for next Sunday to carry in the office, preferably by Thursday. Uh, starting this Wednesday is our online fundraiser. More information about that in the e-news as well as the link. Uh, but we are raising funds to beef up our live streaming abilities so that we might be able to do this not just during the pandemic, but also going forward, recognizing how much uh, this online presence has been able to reach outside of our walls, not just to our members, but uh, those who are watching from a distance uh, and finding us just for the first time. So again, that starts on Wednesday. Be sure to register. Uh, bid early and bid often, as they say. Uh, and then finally, on September 16th, we will be having flu shots here at the church from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. You must have an appointment. Uh, so to get yourself signed up for that appointment, contact Carrie in the office and she will get you registered. Our dear friend at Walgreens is coming over to do that. So you will need to bring an insurance card uh, or I believe they're right around $40 uh, if you will just be paying for it out of pocket. I am already signed up for the five o'clock spot. Uh, so if you see me laying on the ground, uh, when you arrive at 515, you will know that um, uh, the flu shot went as well as I usually uh, handle shots, which is about as well uh, as I fly in airplanes. So, I hope to see you uh, that evening for flu shots. I hope to see you next weekend here in the parking lot for worship. I hope to see you online for the, uh, the online auctions starting on Wednesday. Any other announcements, add them into the chat box uh, or um, send me a note and I can get those announced for next week. But with all of that uh, behind us, we come back to this good news. And it is the good news that sends us out every single week, every single day, every single minute of our lives. That the Lord blesses you and keeps you. The Lord's face shines on you and is gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and gives you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.